a glance at the Java Performance Toolbox. Uh, this talk was ran the first time at the Utrecht JAG, but has been slightly modified since then, so it's not going to be 100% the same talk. Thought to add some novelty to it. Um, welcome. Hope you enjoy JSpring as much as I do. It was great, great day so far. I'm Anna. Um, I'm currently working as a developer advocate for Oracle in the Java Platform Group team. Um, I'm passionate about Java, containers, and Kubernetes. Well, today it's going to be Java and containers, but without Kubernetes in the demos. However, I will slightly touch some Kubernetes at some point, and I'm welcoming your questions uh, after the talk is done, and you can catch me also in the hallway. I'm looking forward to those questions of yours, and especially if you have feedback or questions regarding the JDK tools, I welcome that as well, because uh, I'm preparing some learning regarding the JDK tools, and would be great to know some of your questions. So today's talk is going to be focusing on using the JDK tools for containerized applications and connect how we're using those JDK tools with tools that we normally use in the cloud world, like Prometheus, Grafana, and others. The code will be shared at the end of the session. It's in my GitHub. It's public. So let's start. Speaking of containerized applications, well, when dealing with containers, uh, we have a lot of tools available nowadays to build those container images. And either if we're asking Google or if we're asking ChatGPT, which tool helps me to build the most efficient container image, meaning the smallest in terms of um, memory footprint, but also in size, um, you're going to get a lot of options. So, this means that the best tool is always, it depends. It depends on your experience. It depends what you're feeling more comfortable to develop with. But, um, yeah, let's see how many of them are there. So, these are just the tools that I've used in this lifetime as developers tried to use to, you know, build a container image. But nowadays, I think there are many more. I've uh, been to a recent talk, and I've seen at least seven more than these. But pretty much these were the ones that I considered as a developer that are developer friendly for me. I pretty much love working with JIP and or with build packs, but also with the others. So in this landscape, now we have a lot of options. But I hope that uh, when you started working with containers, if you ever wrote a container image or container Im uh, file, a Docker file, well, Docker file, you wrote a Docker file. So the good old Docker file was our starter. Can you please raise your hand if you wrote even a line in a Docker file so far? Okay, so good. We have a lot of people that wrote even a line in a Docker file. So this means that sometimes you've seen this syntax, these instructions, you're pretty much familiar with them. And we love the good old Docker file because it um, usually has a few rules. We always know that we have to use a small base image, because we, as we remember, we want to build an efficient container image, so that one has to be small in size. Secondly, we also want to create images that have common layers. This helps us with the build time, I um, mean, the amount of time spent with when building it, and of course, we're very, very cautious about how many instructions we're using, Docker instructions meaning. And thirdly, we are installing only what is strictly needed for our application. So we're trying to add into that Docker file what really our application needs. The rest of the uh, variables that our application needs, we usually store it outside. We want to do that instantiation when we are running the container image, not when we are building it. So we have this, but here's the thing. My good old Docker file, it says OpenJDK 10 GRE Slim, because we are used with when running Java applications in containers, we know that we have to run it with the GRE. We don't need the entire JDK. If we run with the entire JDK, our container image is going to be even bigger. And we don't need the entire JDK to run our container image, right? But something happened in JDK 11. Do you know what happened with the GRE in JDK 11? B Courageous. What happened with it? Just shout it. It's gone. it's gone. Yes. It's gone. It's no longer shipped altogether with the JDK. So for us, for developers, I mean, one of my friends told me that he was shocked when he heard that the GRE is no longer there, starting with JDK 11. He still develops with, G, uh, with Java 8. So 
he's not yet affected, let's say so. So he was shocked that there is no more GRE. How am I going to run my application? Okay. There is a way to run your application. You can create your own custom GRE via a tool called JLink. So we can create our own custom Java runtime images for our container images. And the reason behind doing that is not because we would like to create our own custom GRE because it's fancy or nice and because it's cool. It's because we want to have a small container image, right? So we're using JLink for that. Um, and JLink appeared with JEP 282. It started with Java 9, with JDK 9, but probably since a lot of folks thought, ah, this is not an LTS, so I'm probably not going to pay attention that much to this, like my friend probably he didn't think that, well, I should look into JLink. But JLink is nowadays the tool that you can use to assemble and optimize a set of modules and their dependencies into a custom runtime image. By modules, I mean the Java modules, not uh, other types of modules. So, JLink packaging works in as follows. Like in the legacy JDK image, you used to have like the bin, the GRE, and the lib. Now, starting with JDK 9, you can generate your own image and have in it just the bin, the conf, and the modules that your application is using. That's good. That sounds great. Um, but how do we know which modules, right? That's a big question. Like, how do I know my application is using certain modules or not? Now, luckily, if you're using Maven, for example, there's a plugin called Maven Dependencies, and my code is using that one that can help you identify those dependencies and those modules that your application is using, but it's not just that. You can also use a, call, a tool called JDEPS to run that and to understand how your application, what module your application has. So just to give an example of that, just me going to escape this. This is my uh, to-do app, which is Spring Boot application, running on JDK 20. Ta -da -da. Um, and just to well, you make sure that you see this, okay, my Spring Boot 304, running on JDK 20. And let's just hope the Maven dependency plugin that I'm using just to identify my dependencies for my application. And then I'm using the gdaps command. Let me make this bigger. Uh-oh, too big. OK, so the gdaps command, uh, which is, okay. yeah, my laptop doesn't listen to you. Okay, so the JDEPS command is about, well, it's pretty long. It's about ignoring missing dependencies, do it recursively, tag the release, multi-release 20, print the module dependencies, blah, 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 and then where my dependencies are stored in the target job jar. All this is in the readme of the repo, so it's, not, it's nothing for you to remember by heart. And the magic command prints you the list of modules. Okay. Now you have the list of modules that the application is using. That's great. Let's go back to our conversation about packaging. So how we can maintain the good old Docker file now with JLink? We create our runtime stage build, where we make our custom GRE using JLink. So we, from a, we use from a JDK base image, create our own custom GRE with JLink. Secondly, we just do the application stage build, where we're using um, OS building base image. We just need an operating system to run our application on, right? We copy the custom GRE because we need it to run our application. We copy the artifacts of our app, usually a jar file, and then we run the application. Easy as that. So having that list of modules, we can go to the runtime stage build. And not only that, we can create a custom Java runtime just by running Java Home, don't worry, because you're using a from JDK base image. Java Home will be known. There's bin, there's slash bin, slash JLink. There's where JLink is. Then you're adding your modules, the one that were printed earlier with JDEPs, like copy-paste next to the minus minus add modules. And, well, you can um, add some more variables because you don't need some debug information. Um, you don't want to have, you know, helper pages, header files, and other um, information about that. 
and you can specify the compress for the resulted GRE. So in my case is zip. So we can have like compression for resources, like no compression, which is zero, constant string sharing, and zip. I prefer zip. And of course, last but not least, you need an output like where to put your custom Java runtime, right? And I said it like Java runtime, slash Java runtime, a folder, doesn't matter. Okay, now that we've done with the runtime stage build, the application stage build is pretty similar. Like, okay, we have the from, from the OS, and then we're adding some environment variables for the Java home and the path. We add the Java to, the, to our path, because, like we would work on our locals, right? And then we're copying the GRE from the other stage to this stage. So we need the GRE to have that. Like we're copying it, and we uh, have the Java home pointing to our GRE. Now we can continue with application deployment, but we can also add something called JDK Java options, which is an environment variable that I personally love because it makes it easier for me to just play at runtime with my container image with the environment variables that I want to give to it. So in my case, I start with minus minus enable preview, but if I need to add more, um, I don't know, I need to add some incubator modules. I can do that with just JDK Java options. So I don't need to build again and again and again my container image. I'm just saying to it, hey, use this, and it will know. And of course then, run the application. Easy as that. So let's do that with our application as well and see what's going on with it. Let me just escape this. Come on. Okay, good escape. <laughs> cool. So, um, my app, I want to run it, and I have a Docker Compose for it because if I don't have Kubernetes, uh, I would like to use Docker Compose for one reason only is because I want to run my application, but since this talk is also about connecting tools, I want to connect my application to Prometheus and that Prometheus to be used as a data source for my Grafana instance. So I have a sample compose, Docker Compose file with these three services inside it. So I have my Spring Boot to do service that points to an image that I store on GitHub, but I can build now on the spot while talking to you. Um, I have shared that some recordings, so I want to share some output on the folder recordings. Then I have my Prometheus service. Let me make this even bigger. Um, that is linking, of course, to Spring Boot to do service. And I have a Prometheus configuration that I want to give to my Prometheus, local Prometheus. And of course, a Grafana configuration uh, that looks to the Prometheus that I've just instantiated earlier in the other service. So I'm connecting all these three so I can get some information, I can monitor what's going on with my system as well. Right, so let's start the app. Docker compose app minus minus build. Now I'm relying a lot on the internet because it's gonna download a few things, I think. Okay, so let's start the app. Uh, spring boot to the service, good. That's as good as running. It's pretty simple, I'll just add to-dos, modify to-dos, uh, sample to-do. You can delete it, edit, and so on. Whenever I'm adding a to-do, I'm also adding a tag to it, so that's why you see that. Congratulations, and this is a tag for your to-do app there. Um, that's me. Okay, so my Grafana is also running, perfect. All is good. Let's apply some load. So I have a little script that does this. I apply some load to my application, meaning it batches a lot of requests of adding, deleting, putting information to my application. If it's gonna start this year, I hope. Hmm? Usually it prints something, that's why I'm like surprised it doesn't print anything right now. Come on, come on. Okay, while well, the load is doing this, its thing, what I want to inspect with my application is that how much memory is you know, actually consuming, if it's all great and how the memory is going with it. And I'm using a script that one of my colleagues has created to print the PSS memory that my application is using. Okay. Some context deadline exceeded. Hmm. 
it's weird, but now it's okay. Okay, so it's fine. Uh, so my print PSS script is doing as following. So we want to monitor how much memory my application is using, um, and it's just doing a little cut, a little cut into uh, the memory that my application is using and printing that. Now, because I'm running this against a containerized app, I just need to like run the script there. So I'm going to say cat print pss.ch. Oh, this one. Docker exec minus i. Uh, I need the ID of my container, which is container name from here, Spring Boot to Do Service, and bash. I really hope, yeah. I was not 100% sure that this is the command. So now it's monitoring the, PS, the memory that my application is using when is a, a lot of load against it and what's going on with it. So I can see that even though that the load that I'm applying to my application is constant, the memory that my application is using, you'll observe that it's going to grow and grow and grow until there's going to be something unexpected happening to it. So just to, you know, make the die easier. I have a simulate endpoint uh, that applies even more load to this. So we're applying even more load to see what's going on with the application. And let's continue with this. Now, when you're seeing that your memory is consumption is going up, but the, cons the, the users that are you know, hitting your application, it, uh, it's, the number of those is constant, or maybe it's lower because you know, having the same amount of users hitting your application, all like, you know, demanding something from your application for a long time to the same endpoints is quite improbable in the same time. There should be some fluctuation and some downscale in those amount of users, at least at some point. You're probably thinking like, okay, shouldn't this memory at some point go a little down, like the consumption should be lower, but it continues to grow and grow and grow. Sometimes you can see that there's some less memory being used, but then it spins up and consumes even more. So in that case, you're starting to think that maybe your application has something called like a memory leak, right? And how do we investigate memory leaks? Well, you can send diagnostic commands using a JDK tool called JCMD. Um, okay, so first of all, let's see a little bit about the memory. Let's go back and see how our application is doing. So, to fine tune the JVM flags, we're usually doing the fine tuning of the JVM flags when the defaults don't really produce the expected results for us. So, uh, in that case, we're looking, thinking about our memory. So we have the heap memory, the memory within the JVM process that is used to hold the Java objects. We have the native memory, the memory that is used by the JVM as it runs on the operating system. And of course, there's some direct memory that's similar to native, but it also implies some hardware under there. So we're thinking, okay, fine tuning JVM flags. And if you're gonna search internet, the first thing they're gonna say to you, if you think or suspect there's a memory leak, think about the native memory usage. So that's the first one that you should suspect. Uh, so if you wanna track the native memory usage with JCMD, you first need to add the tool. So because the tool is not considered part of your application, the JDAPs will not you know, identify it there. But you can add it with a simple command call. You can just add a comma and just put jtk.jcmd as a module there. Secondly, you can track the existing memory with JCMD. By the way, don't try to overuse JCMD commands like, you know, send those commands all the time or have like a script that pulls your containers all the time with JCMD commands. Just use it when you need it. But you can do this and you can ask, you know, your application about how much native memory are you using if there's a flag called native memory tracking enabled. By default, it's on off. So you have to specify the summary or detail for this. And the way you can do it because we have the JDK Java options. If you're using Kubernetes, you can say kubectl set environment and for that deployment and set that environment variable for JDK Java options. Um, but not only this, um, you can create 
a native memory baseline. So you can say, hey, JCMD, create a native memory baseline, like make a snapshot of my, how, my, my, how much my application is consuming from that native memory at a certain point in time. And then compare that using summary diff. So use JCMD, the ID of your JVM, and summary diff. Now in this case, I'm using kubectl exec because I want to send that command like one time to that container image. I don't want that to be ran as an argument or an, as another way against my container all the time. So kubectl exec in my case will do it. So the diff can be used to observe the change where exactly the memory is being used. Now over the time the JC works, you're going to see that there's an increase and a decrease in the memory. But if there only is an increase in the memory usage, then maybe you have a memory leak. So let's think about our application. Uh, it seems to be still fine, um, still doing well, OK. Um, so let's see how it's going with it. And first of all, we need to enable the flag and see if the flag is there. So one of my scripts, that's called flag.ch, is actually executing that against my container. So what it does, it prints the JVM flags with the GCMD one, which is the ID of my JVM, uh, to that. So when the, all the flags are being printed, I don't see the native memory tracking between the minimum hip size and the non-method code hip size. But I'm thinking like maybe I'm not saying well, fine. I want to see the native memory. So we can also use the jcmd one vmnative memory. And it says that native memory tracking is not enabled. Now, I don't know by heart you know, all the details about the flags, so I can use jinfo, which is another JDK tool, to print what I need to add that to my configuration. So let's just add it into my Docker Compose. Just have it here, but not off on summary. All right. And now we need to reload a little bit our context. Let's stop the load. Come on. OK, so this is stopped. Let's build it again and see how our native memory is doing. Let's go up, go up. OK. So application started. Let's apply some load. Let's go to that. Um, OK. Hoping that, yeah, something is happening. Good. Now let's run again the flag.ch. Now it's going to print all the flags. Everything's going to be fine. Come on. Hope that my laptop is still doing well. Come on. Hmm? I hope I'm not freezing my laptop with all this. Okay, it's doing something, cool. Good, it printed some information in the output, which is okay. Yeah, so I need more than this, okay? I need to do the baseline and the diff. So in my track script, I do this, I do the baseline, and then I do the diff. So I do the baseline and I wait like, I think like 10 seconds to do the diff. Like wait 10 seconds. And then do the diff. Okay. <laughs> Are my recordings? Nothing yet. Yes, uh, when the diff is done, it should be but my laptop is very, very slow. Hmm. Um, it should be outputting a summary.div.txt in my recordings. So I have now a summary with the amount of users that I'm having. So usually when you're getting the summary, you're looking over values that are abnormal for your application. So usually look like, hey, is the amount of class instances, for example, like jumping to a huge number, like thousands? Is the class base jumping to, I don't know, not one kilobyte, but megabytes um, in those seconds? Uh, amount of threads used, are those like in a horrible amount of 
of threads like spawning over those 10 seconds. But in this case, there's nothing wrong with the current situation. So you started out, that's the native memory, you know, that's uh, to be blamed. Okay, if you want to like 100% check that it's all good, you can also run another tool that's called jconsole because I can connect to my remote process via GMX, which I have enabled in my container image. Um, and since I get this information here, I can look over the memory. I can see that memory is still going up and up and up. But if I perform a JC, like a request a garbage collection, I can see that, well, I'll see in a bit, that the memory used is going to go down. The same thing like if there would be a, like a, a suspicious amount of classes or threads that are increasing, you would see that going on whenever you're like uh, applying or requesting the JC, the garbage collection, you would see that happening to your application. Um, at the end of this presentation, I ha have some links uh, where you, you can see how a native memory leak happens and how gconsole can help you to look into it. But uh, that's at the end. So right now, you're kind of doubting that things are actually bad for your app, right? So since they're not that bad, come on. Um, let's think more. We can get statistics about the running Java processes. So we can think about, you know, getting statistics about what's going on with our Java processes in our applications using tools like JSTAT. So for example, in, our, in this case, you can run JSTAT to see the performance statistics for that uh, JVM ID, right? And what that JSTAT command says is like, uh, take 50 samples of what's going on with the garbage collection, how garbage collection works, every uh, 500 milliseconds. So the number there is in milliseconds, that's why you see 500. Secondly, you can print the heap summary, so you can print the histogram of how of the, your object allocations by using the jmap command line utility. So you can print the memory-related statistics for that running uh, VM or core file. Um, but in this case, if you're running those tools, it will not prove to you that there's something wrong with the application necessarily. However, it consumes a lot, a lot of memory. So. Thinking about that and at our application, maybe since our application at some point is still consuming and consuming resources, we can profile that application using JDK Flight Recorder, right? And see what's going on with it. So for the JDK Flight Recorder, we can use the JDK Flight Recorder for profiling on spot or getting events continuously with the GFR Event Streaming API. So let's do a little of that. Let me see if I, yeah. Okay, let me route the simulate. Good. So let's start a flight recorder. Um, but to start the flight recorder, I can use the JCMD command to like start the recording and so on, or I can use, and I can enable G, uh, JCMD, I can use the JDK flight recorder with minus XX start flight recording. So I'm going to use this one for my app. I have a custom profile also shared in my repo. Okay, let's stop this and also the load because I want to take into account the new flags. Okay, let's start. So what this does, it says, okay, start the flight recording when the container is starting, dump recordings in recordings uh, folder, um, use the settings from myprofile.gfc that is uh, next to it, and of course, keep the max age for the recordings like five minutes, and if, for example, my application is crashing, dump that recording on exit, right? Good, so let's run the recording, let's run the road load first. And then, uh, okay, start the load. And then I want to start the record. Because right now it's just inserting a lot of information there. Okay. Record. Done. Okay. 
So we'll do the recording and try that. While the recording is happening, I can go to the Java Mission Control, the G, sorry, GDK Mission Control tool, open my recording, I have a backup recording, uh, as that one is being overwritten, the other one is being overwritten as the way you speak, for when my application has crashed. Now, I don't know how to make this a little bigger, unfortunately, I need the window. Show view, show perspective. Yeah, I need to ask on how I can make this a little bit bigger because I know it cannot be seen up in the back. So you can already see that what the new version of the GDK Mission Control does, it shows you only the red stuff. So the previous version I used to have on my computer, I used to you know, show you also the green checks for your application. And in this case, it shows to me where my application is not looking great. So there's a lot of garbage collection pressure. There are a lot of errors thrown. Uh, the full collection didn't work, so the full garbage collection didn't work well over my objects. And there are other parts that are really disturbing for my application. However, if I'm expecting a memory leak, I can go to the memory tab in the uh, left menu. And looking here, in my, I got a lot of information about a lot of objects and how they're being allocated. But I see that byte, the first one, you know, has like 54.5% of the total allocation. And I get a stack tree. So GFR is good for this because you get not just what's happening with your objects and how they're allocated, you also get a stack trace of how that allocation happened. And unfortunately, this is not very big, but if you're gonna like search in the stack trace, what you have to search for usually, because you know it's not native memory, so it's not the JVM, the way the JVM is working in collaboration with your OS, but it might be something that you did that might not be that great. So if you're gonna like search a little bit and you're not gonna go very, very far, you can find a reference to your add new to-do item in to-do controller, for example, in my case. So there's something with the to-do item, but if I'm gonna like search an even, even lower for my app, and just need to find a new one for the org Agni. Oh, come on. Okay. So yeah, there's a, a problem with the fact that I, I'm adding items, but I'm not, okay. So I'm adding item, add new to do, okay. Sounds good. It's nothing bad with adding to do's. Um, this is not the best view ever <laughs> for spotting information. Well, there should be something, but I'm not seeing them right now, with add to do item, but also with the update. And the reason why the problem is with the to do and update is as follows. Let me go to my to do controller and go to to do, make this bigger. So what happens? Um, I add a new item, right? So I'm adding a new item, let me make it a little bigger. I'm adding a new item. So whenever I'm adding a new item, I'm issuing a post request with my item. I'm just sending that to the database, that's great, right? But I'm also creating a tag in my tags hash map. So the tags here, by the way, it's a map. That's getting to do as a key and the string as a value, right? So I'm all the time putting the item as my key and some content to uppercase and created on blah, blah, blah on that. What this means is that when my object is being put in the hash map, what the hash map is doing is looking at the key, makes the hash code of the key, and based on that is allocating the key with the entry within its buckets. So that's how it's remembering, like, look, I'm adding this, I'm gonna retrieve this object later on. But what happens is that later on, I'm modifying that object in the update to do item. But in update to do item, I do not touch the tags anymore. So what happens is that now there is a tags hash map containing a reference to a to do item that has a hash code for <coughs> um, um, value for, for a reference of that object that was like older in time, but now I've dated it. So for example, remove method will no longer find that item to remove it from the hash map. So all this time, 
My hash map is growing whenever I'm updating and no longer touch updating the item object, but that be, it's being stored in my hash map but it's never being updated anymore since I've used that as a key. So what's going on is my hash map is continuously increasing and increasing and increasing wherever the load is coming. So by load, I'm not saying just adding information. Even updates and small updates can make that hash map grow and be difficult to be cleared. And even if I'm doing a delete, like say tags remove, it's not going to do any, um, any, do any good of this because it's going to remove the item with the latest state. It's not going to remember the previous states before updating it. Okay, so we got that, but no longer this. No, okay, we kind of by see the processes. We do the cat, which is that was a script. However, in real life, we don't have cat print PSS scripts that you run against each of the containers, and you see like, oh, there's a problem. The memory is increasing. You're probably using monitoring tools like Prometheus, or you see nice graphs, Grafana. You like pull the information from Prometheus in Grafana graphs, and you see like, oh, things are growing up, but never going down. Uh, you get alerts that, okay, there's too much memory being used, or there's uh, an out of memory happening, or that your containers have restarted alarmingly uh, often within your Kubernetes environment. So, what you can do, besides adding the GFR to your container image as a tool, and starting GFR, like in my case, with minus XS start flight recording. You have several options to start your flight recording, but no longer, that, not just that, you can use GFR streaming to stream continuously events to about how your JVM is behaving. So use those events to like, you know, share the information in Prometheus, for example, as a gosh, um, or average, min, max, whatever, you want for a specific metric of your JVM and get that information later on. So that is a, this API is available there. You just have to open the repository of events and inspect your event there. So just to show you a bit on how that is done, let me go to the application. So I'm trying the event stream open repository. I'm opening the repositories. And I'm doing this when my application has started, when my application is ready, when my Spring Boot application is ready. I open the repository of events, and then um, I am saying, like, hey, on the event, uh, let me see which event I have here. <laughs> GDK, GC, hip summary. Actually, I'm going to copy paste this. GDK, GC, hip summary. Here, I want to record this event, and when this event is being recorded, stream this to a gauge and add that gauge to my metric registry, which can be Prometheus or whatever tool you're using for monitoring, right? Um, let me see what else we have here. Heap used. Heap used. Okay and record the event, add the description for it. Uh, I think it's in bytes. Heap, chase, uh, heap, so heap used in bytes, right? Add a description if you want to like have a good description. Record the event and you get like one of the fields of the events and in this case, I think my field is uh, heap used, so I want this field and get it here. So I'm getting this field and I'm streaming this as a uh, gosh, okay. And let's go here to the Prometheus endpoint of my Springwood app. <coughs> Hopefully it's not dead. Please, please, please. No, it's not dead. Let's stop this. Okay, JDK. Ah, it's not loaded yet. One second. Come on, load. Because I'm not going to find it if it's not there. Anyway, by the fact that I did my own gosh, and the fact that I have added that to the metric registry that I'm having, in this case Prometheus, 
I will be able to have it here on actuator slash Prometheus, the endpoint that's being pulled by Prometheus and ask like, hey, how are you doing? Um, and having Prometheus as a data source, oh, come on, why are you? Everything's very slow. Hmm. So, because I have all my three services connected, I also have my Prometheus as a data source in Grafana, and there's a small dashboard that shows those metrics that I have created in correlation with other metrics that my, you know, Micrometer is giving you, like HTTP server requests, active, and all these other metrics, and you can compare those metrics with the others, but apparently, my computer is not responding anymore. Um, so, um, you can use the GFR streaming for this, like for con you know getting information in selected metrics to a monetary service. But if you want to profile your application, then well, don't use the events. Use just the JDK flight recording, the tool to make a recording for like five minutes or ten minutes, or just profile your application at that point in time. The events can like trigger for you alerts that maybe your application is not feeling well and can give you information like that would be good time to you, for you to profile the app, right? You can of course create your own custom GFR events if you feel that the ones that are already given are not enough, you want to make your own in collaboration with your application. So what you have to do, you can just um, go and make new settings by um, extending the JDK GFR setting control. Um, then um, you just create your own custom event by extending JDK.GFR event. So these are in the JDK itself. And then you can register the event with a JDK.GFR setting definition. And Gunnar Molling has a very good example on how to make your own custom events um, for Quarkus, I think, uh, in its repository. And I link that into my links. Then once you have your own custom events, well, of course, you have to make them available. So you can do that by registering them as a, in a filter. So that's what I did to make my events available for my Spring Boot app, my custom events for my Spring Boot app. And then I record those custom events in metrics uh, by using a servlet listener. So I have to register that one as well. And of course, all of this is in the repo. So you have the repo there with the Grafana dashboard, with all my settings, uh, with the code that I've shared you earlier, and I'm going to share also the slides so for you to get all the links there. Because there are also links on how to use JDK Flight, JDK Flight Recorder, and I think Billy has made recently a sip of Java on the latest JDK mission control, because it was released recently, and that one is very short and easy to understand as well. Thank you, everybody. Welcoming for your questions and your feedback, and yes. Give me two minutes. <laughs>